Tonight, Gandhi gains. Rahul Gandhi prepares to face off against Modi's pressure as he succeeds at securing his spot as the leader of the opposition. Foil fans. The cool chaos in Bolivia begins to settle down as armed forces withdraw from presidential palace. Stuck in space. Boeing's Starliner capsule faces technical issues, delaying astronauts' return to Earth. And Panda Diplomacy. San Diego welcomes new pandas from China after two decades as a symbol of renewed Sino-American friendship. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Warnasuriya. Good evening and thank you for tuning in on World News. We have lots of fresh updates to bring you and we begin in India. Rahul Gandhi was selected as the leader of the opposition Lok Sabha, marking the first time this post has been filled during Prime Minister Narendra Modi's decade-long ruling. Despite opposition's symbolic move to nominate a candidate for the speaker post, Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party and its allies re-elected the incumbent Om Birla yesterday. Rahul Gandhi of the Congress Party has been appointed leader of the opposition in India's parliament, filling a post that had been vacant for a decade. This marks the first time Prime Minister Narendra Modi's main rival has held a constitutional role since joining politics in 2004. Mr. Gandhi will now participate in committees responsible for key appointments, acting as a counterbalance to the Prime Minister. Despite Mr. Modi's continued hold on power with the support of allies, his party fell short of a majority after two consecutive landslide victories. The Congress party secured 99 seats in the recent general election, exceeding the 10% threshold needed to claim the opposition leader's post. Political commentators noted that Gandhi's appointment is expected to bring a positive change for India's democracy and test his leadership skills. And still in the region, a searing heat wave in Karachi, Pakistan's largest city, has resulted in deaths of at least 450 people over the past four days. It was reported that 427 bodies were received by the healthcare institutions within the four days, while the Sindh government disclosed 23 additional deaths from three government hospitals. The Eddy Ambulance Service, which typically transports 30 to 40 bodies to the Karachi city morgue daily, reported collecting around 568 bodies over the last six days, with 141 of those on Tuesday alone. Although it is too early to determine the exact cause of death in each case, the surge in fatalities coincided with Karachi's temperatures soaring above 40 degrees Celsius. Reports indicated that the high humidity made it feel as hot as 49 degrees Celsius. In response to the heat wave, hospitals have seen an influx of patients. According to the civil hospital in Karachi, the hospital admitted 267 people with heat stroke between Sunday and yesterday, of whom 12 died. Most patients were in their 60s or 70s, although some were in their 40s and 20s. Symptoms included vomiting, diarrhea and high fever, often among those who had been working outside. Experts concur that extreme weather events are increasing in frequency and intensity due to climate change. The current heat wave in Karachi is expected to persist into next week, although slightly lower temperatures are forecasted. On to more diplomacy updates now. South Korea, the United States and Japan emphasized their commitment to enhancing trilateral cooperation on critical technologies and economic security during their first ministerial meeting in Washington. The ministers highlighted the need for close alignment in developing advanced technologies and strengthening supply chain resiliency to address the global risk and promote mutual interest. Industry ministers of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan in their first trilateral meeting have agreed to strengthen their cooperation on supply chains and economic security. The meeting in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday local time was held between South Korea's Minister of Trade, Industry and Energy, Andok Kun, and its U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Gina Raimondo and Saito Ken. This was a follow-up meeting after the leaders of the three countries decided at Camp David last August to hold these ministerial meetings. In a joint statement on Wednesday, the three ministers said their shared intent was to promote the development of critical and emerging technologies and strengthen the security and resiliency of their economies through a trilateral mechanism. Saying their top priority is to strengthen resilience of supply chains and fields such as chips and batteries, they also said they aim to promote principles on resilient and reliable supply chains that contain rules of transparency, diversification, security and sustainability. 
The ministers also agreed to improve their cooperation in advanced technologies like AI and core minerals. While some experts point out that the trilateral meeting was held to ask for Korea and Japan to join export control efforts against China, one professor spoke about Korea's stance. And as part of the ministerial meeting, the top industry officials agreed to meet annually at the ministerial level, along with regular working level meetings. Bolivian armed forces withdrew from the presidential palace in La Paz last night and General Juan Jose Suniga was arrested after President Luis Arce condemned an attempted coup against his government. Earlier, Suniga recently stripped of his command, led military units in Plaza Morelo, where an armored vehicle rammed the palace door before the soldiers stormed in. What appeared to be a coup attempt by soldiers in Bolivia failed on Wednesday. A top general leading armed forces allied to him tried to storm the presidential palace in La Paz, with eyewitness video showing an armored vehicle ram palace doors and soldiers rush in. But they quickly pulled back in the evening. And the general, Juan Jose Zuniga, was arrested hours later on live TV, taken away and later replaced. Witness saw soldiers withdraw from the central Plaza Murillo Square, home to the presidential palace and Congress. People continued to gather, heeding an earlier call from President Luis Arce to resist the coup attempt. Arce himself later appeared from a balcony and thanked the public. It fills us with bravery, courage to keep resisting, to keep on resisting any coup attempt. Because Bolivia deserves its democracy, which has been won in the streets and with blood, brothers and sisters. The president replaced General Zuniga by swearing in Jose Wilson Sanchez as the new military commander and called for calm and order to be restored. Tension is building in Bolivia ahead of general elections next year. Zuniga has recently hit out at leftist ex-president Evo Morales, saying he should not be allowed to return and threatening to block him if he does. Morales is planning a return to power by running against Arce, his one-time socialist ally. Zuniga had also spoken to reporters in the square, saying that anger was growing in the landlocked country. Bolivia has been battling an economic slump with depleted central bank reserves as well as pressure on the Boliviano currency as exports of gas dry up. The public prosecutor's office said it would launch a criminal investigation against Zuniga and others involved in the attempted coup. In the final debate before the upcoming UK general election, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak clashed with the Labour leader K. Starmer, with Sunak causing Starmer of dishonesty of various issues. Starmer reported by criticising Sunak's wealth, suggesting it made him out of touch with the ordinary Britons. Britain's final debate before next week's general election was a testy standoff, with current Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, whose party is trailing in the polls, going head-to-head -head with Keir Starmer, leader of the Labour Party. I would like to do if I... Polling puts Labour far ahead of Sunak's Conservatives by around 20 points. He's not being honest with everyone. And on Wednesday, the Prime Minister made a last-ditch attack on Starmer, accusing him of being dishonest on issues from tax and women's rights to immigration. Starmer fired back, saying that Sunak was too rich to understand the concerns of most ordinary Britons. A snap YouGov poll said the debate had been a 50-50 tie. They cannot be returned to where they came from, can they, Prime Minister? On immigration, a top concern for British voters, Sunak rejected Starmer's argument that he would try and return migrants to their home countries, saying many are from Iran, Syria and Afghanistan. Are you going to sit down with the Iranian Ayatollahs? Are you going to try and do a deal with the Taliban? It's completely nonsensical what you are saying, right? It's, you are taking... I mean, you are taking people for fools, right? I think that these people should not stay in our country. They will be on planes to Rwanda. Starmer also argued the country was exhausted after 14 years of conservative chaos and that he would better understand the challenges of many families who have struggled under soaring inflation and a cost of living crisis. Polls indicate Labour on course to win the election with a whopping majority. Sunak's campaign has struggled since the beginning. He launched the election in pouring rain in Downing Street and was heavily criticised for failing to attend a D-Day memorial event. Sakia Starmer also attacked the Prime Minister over a recent betting scandal, which saw five Conservative Party officials investigated over bets that were placed on the timing of an early election. Because this isn't just um, you know, what's happened this week, uh, last week in the Gambling Commission. We saw Partygate 
earlier in this parliament, the Prime Minister himself was convicted and fined for breaking the rules which he brought in and imposed on everybody else. However, Starmer has also faced criticism at public events too. He's been accused by voters of sticking to a script and being robotic and failing to give enough information on how he would fund much needed improvements to public services. Ballot boxes open on July the 4th. European leaders are converging on Brussels to finalise the appointments for key EU positions just days before a critical French election which could significantly impact the bloc. Despite an anticipated agreement among major parties, tensions are high as Italy's Giorgia Meloni and Hungary's Viktor Orban express their discontent over being excluded from the deal. The European Council will convene a two-day meeting starting today to discuss the strategic agenda for 2024 to 2029 with a focus on Ukraine, the Middle East and overall security and defence. The summit aims to enhance Europe's security through robust defence preparedness, addressing traditional and hybrid threats. A key outcome of the summit is expected to be the signing of a security agreement between the EU and Ukraine, which will boost military aid and utilize the interest from Russia's frozen assets to fund Ukraine. The EU has provided over 143 billion euros in aid to Ukraine, including 33 billion euros in military support. In the short term, the summit seeks to equip the EU with better tools to enhance regional defence capabilities, while in the long term, the integration of new strategic allies may encounter resistance in the EU Parliament due to the rise of nationalist parties. We'll time for a short commercial break. More will news coming right after this. And on the road to the White House, the first general election debate of 2024 election season is happening early tomorrow morning, marking a historic moment regardless of what transpires on stage. Well, President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump will participate in tomorrow's debate in Atlanta, the first ever matchup between a sitting president and a former one occurring unusually early in the campaign cycle. To avoid scenes like this in 2020, Will you shut who, is your, up, man? Listen, who is on your list? Both Joe Biden and Donald Trump have agreed to a new set of rules for their 2024 TV rematch. We have ended this segment. Each candidate's microphone will be muted for the first debate of the campaign, except when it's his turn to speak. Host CNN said that during the 90 minute face off, there will also be no live audience. Podium positions and the order of closing statements will be determined by a coin flip. And candidates will not be allowed notes or props, but will be given a pen and a pad of paper. After lobbying from both candidates, the TV event is taking place months earlier than usual. But it will also be the first debate either candidate has participated in in this campaign season, as Biden ran largely unopposed and Trump skipped the Republican primary debates. About 6 in 10 American adults say they're likely to watch the debate live or in clips or read about the performance of the candidates in the news or social media. Kenya's President William Ruto reversed his controversial tax reforms following mass protests that turned violent, which according to the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights resulted in 23 deaths. In a rare admission of defeat, Ruto conceded public pressure, marking a sharp reversal from his earlier firm stance against the protesters. Kenya's President William Ruto backed down on planned tax hikes on Wednesday, bowing to pressure after deadly nationwide protests. Listening keenly to the people of Kenya who have said loudly that they want nothing to do with this finance bill 2024, I concede and therefore I will not sign. 
Ruto's backtracking will be seen as a major victory for a week-old youth-led protest movement that grew from online condemnations of tax increases into mass rallies. Demonstrators stormed parliament on Tuesday as protests were held across the country. Police opened fire on the crowds, who later broke into the assembly's compound just minutes after lawmakers had voted through the tax measure. Some demonstrators said on social media that despite Ruto's climb down, they would go ahead with a rally planned for Thursday, with many reiterating demands that he resign. Medics said violent clashes between police and protesters had left at least 23 people dead across the country and scores wounded. A Kenyan news outlet reported protests in at least 35 of Kenya's 47 counties. The unrest marks the most serious crisis of Ruto's two-year-old presidency, and the about-face may see off the immediate threat of more action. But it leaves him caught between the competing demands of his hard-pressed citizens and of lenders such as the IMF, which is urging the government to cut deficits to obtain more financing. When two veteran NASA astronauts, Butch Vilmo and Suni Williams, blasted off from Earth on the 5th June for the International Space Station, they expected to head home in a week or so. Well, however, it's now been three weeks and counting as NASA and Boeing troubleshoot equipment problems putting their flight home on hold. Problems with Boeing's Starliner capsule have upended the original plans for the return of two astronauts to Earth, leaving them aboard the International Space Station as teams look at last-minute fixes. Since its liftoff on June 5th, the capsule has had five helium leaks, five maneuvering thrusters go dead, and a propellant valve failed to close completely. The current problems center on Starliner's expendable propulsion system, which is needed to back away from the ISS and position it to dive through Earth's atmosphere. Starliner can stay docked at the ISS for up to 45 days, according to comments by NASA's commercial crew manager Steve Stitch. He said recent test firings of the thrusters gave mission teams confidence in a safe return, though tests and reviews are ongoing. A source who spoke on the condition of anonymity said internally NASA's latest targeted return date is July 6th. That would mean the mission, originally planned for eight days, would instead last a month. Even with the propulsion issues, NASA has said Starliner would still be capable of returning the astronauts to Earth if absolutely necessary. That is, if the capsule must serve as an escape pod. If Starliner is deemed incapable of safely returning Barry, Butch Wilmore and Sunita Sunny Williams, one option would be sending them home aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon. NASA and Boeing officials, as well as engineers familiar with the program, told nothing about Starliner's current problems indicates that this would be needed. This is Starliner's first mission to orbit carrying astronauts, the final test needed before NASA can certify it as the U.S. Space Agency's second ride to the ISS. This going for a short commercial break. More well news coming on the other side. Welcome back. Two giant pandas, Yun Shuan and Xin Bao, departed from Ya'an City in the southwest China Sichuan province to begin a 10-year international giant panda protection cooperation in the United States. The duo will transit through Hong Kong and are scheduled to arrive today in the United States, accompanied by experienced breeders and veterinarians. For the first time in 20 years, giant pandas are heading to the U.S. Yun Xuan and Xin Bao, leaving the lush mountain forests here bound for San Diego. A 7,000-mile journey that has been months in the making. Their departure revives China's panda diplomacy, a tradition people worried would end as relations with the U.S. have soured. As part of what China calls a new round of conservation, more pandas will land at other American zoos, including Washington, D.C., later this year. Adored around the world, China's treasured bears are celebrities here, too. There's even criticism on Chinese social media over pandas being shared with the U.S. Unaware of their global significance, most prefer to eat, lounge, and repeat. When a panda moves to another country, it takes roughly a month to adjust to the new climate and different food. 
they can eat 80 pounds of bamboo a day. We're told that Yunchuan loves it, while Xinbao eats apples and cornbread too. They also need to get used to each other. The hope, of course, is that panda babies and all that cuteness might follow. For now, their departure is set, the preparations complete, and the pandas are coming. Well, that is all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune again tomorrow for more key updates from the Kossi World. Well, stay tuned as Sina Maya will join you in a moment with the Nike Business Report. Thank you and have a good night.